Okay, so let's start the next module four. Um, I will, um, um, it is devoted to the survival analysis and I will start with a, a very short, uh, uh, relatively short introduction to the methods because um, the, the um, running those methods is actually very simple as just, um, you know, a matter of running a single command in R, but it's really important to understand what's behind those commands and how to interpret the data that comes out of those commands. And so uh, in the beginning, I will um, um, show you um, what it is uh, to do the survival analysis. So the disease characterization is um, composed of, uh, contains two major components. The uh, molecular profiling of a whole genome or a whole transcriptome and clinical data. These are two complementary data that should be used together in order to do a um, uh, reasonable research and get a knowledge out of what you do. So the clinical data is intrinsically different from the data that um, uh, you've been seeing so far in the course from the uh, high resolution molecular profiling data. So this slide shows you um, the typical example of clinical data available for uh, tumor patients and the clinical data would be all of those things the ID of the patient race family history nodal status yes or no or number of nodes involved then radiation or chemotherapy hormone therapy uh, protein IH, uh, IHC then staging size of a tumor age of the diagnosis then hormones level and etc all of this is the clinical information and now there is a special type of clinical variables we call them variables which pertain time and these are called survival times so for instance overall outcome dead or alive this is a status that, that is related to the survival time then overall survival time of the patient disease specific outcome dead or alive disease specific survival time recurrence status time to recurrence time to distance recurrence and um, status of a distance recurrence so these are all um, clinical variables that are related to the survival uh, to the two times right and so they require special type of analysis which is called survival analysis what is the survival analysis? We typically have three major goals in survival analysis. First of them is to estimate the probability of individual surviving for a given time period, say one year, given the disease characteristics that the patient presents. And uh, for this type of analysis, we use Kaplan-Meier survival curve or a life table, which are um, just a different representation of the same data. Now, another goal can be to compare survival experiences of two different groups of individuals, say, treated with a drug or and placebo. And for that purpose, uh, you uh, construct a Kaplan-Meier curve, but they do not really tell you whether the survival experience is statistically different. For that purpose, we use log rank test, which compares um, different Kaplan-Meier curves and gives you p-value. Another goal can be uh, to detect clinical, genomic, epidemiologic variables which contribute to the risk, uh, so associated with poor prognosis. And there may be multiple variables that you want to take into account. And for that kind of analysis, we use multivariate Cox regression model that tries to estimate the survival or a, say, relative risk of poor outcome taking into consideration multiple variables. So survival data, what, what is the survival data? Survival time is the time from a fixed point to end point. There may be different starting point and different end points. These are just an examples. So say the starting point was the surgery and the end point was death or recurrence or relapse of the disease. So the time between these two 
point is considered to be survival time. Uh, another example of a pair of starting and end points is a time of a diagnosis to death or recurrence or relapse. Another uh, may be uh, treatment as a starting point and then the end point something like the same death, recurrence or relapse. So the, the specifics of the survival data is that we almost never observe the event of interest in all subjects. So at any given time of a clinical study, not all of the patients reach the outcome. Our outcome is they succumb to the disease, dead. So not all of them are dead. So we have not observed the event of research interest, not a clinical interest, uh, in all of the patients. And these incomplete observations are called censored observations. And certainly this type of data requires uh, a special analytical techniques. So a bit more on the censored observations. So they arise whenever the dependent variable of interest represents the time to a terminal event and the duration of the study is limited in time. Now this is incomplete observation the event of interest did not occur at the time of the analysis. So this table shows you a few examples of censored observations. So say event of interest, death of the disease, censored observation would be still alive. Now uh, the event of, in of interest, survival of marriage, then censored observation, well still married, big surprise. Now another example, uh, event of interest, dropout time from school, Censored observation, the student is still in school. So there are two types of censoring, type 1 and type 2 censoring. So type 1 censoring uh, is more frequently used and it pertains um, to uh, the fixed time. And then um, calculating the fraction of of uh, those subjects that have reached the end point and the rest who did not reach the end point. So the time is fixed and this would be type 1 censoring. Type 2 censoring is that um, it happens when um, the proportion of subjects is fixed. So say um, we end the study whenever we reach 50% uh, uh, of events. So 50% of subjects reached the end point. And we're going to stop the study and that would be censoring of type 2. Now there is also right and left censoring which uh, pertains pretty much the uh, the time continuum. So the, the um, left censoring for instance here is, is that you do not know when uh, there was a start point. For instance, the patient comes into clinic and the patient is admitted to the clinic on the basis of a diagnosis of a certain disease. But now you do not really know how long the patient has had this disease. So, so this would be an example of a uh, left censoring. Now the data with right censoring happens, well, uh, for instance, um, a patient um, dropped out of study. And so it w uh, the patient was follow up for a number of years for the recurrence of the disease and suddenly uh, the patient leaves the area, moves to another town and it just drops out of study. And so we do not know when this patient will relapse. So this is a time, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the right censoring. There, there can be an interval censoring when the event of interest can be estimated to happen within a certain uh, time interval, but not at the exact uh, point in time. So the, the, um, the example of that would be the patient has, um, has come back to the clinic and it, it's, it's evident, it, it's obvious that the patient has relapsed. When did the patient relapse? 
because there is already a substantial, you know, um, um, disease that is going on in the patient. But when exactly the relapse happened, we do not know. Maybe a month ago, maybe half a year ago, and you know the patient was asymptomatic and he just didn't come to the clinic. So how do we estimate the uh, survival probability of a patient to survive for a certain period of time and how the Kaplan-Meier curves are constructed? So the graph on the left represents um, uh, the process um, of um, how the patients process through study. So for the first six months, uh, the, pa uh, the patient's um, accrual is taking place, place and for the next 12 months they are followed up. And so you see the patients can join the study at different time points and so they would be followed up um, different um, length of time. Right, and so if you, if you uh, sort these patients so and now the the clear the clear circles would be censored observations, and the um, the filled circles would be uh, the patients who reached the endpoint. So they are dead. Say. So now, if you order these patients according to the follow-up time, you you end up with the graph like that on the right, and at each and every uh, time when the uh, event of interest occurs you can compute the fraction of patients who are still alive right and this will give you uh, these probabilities okay so survival probability for a given length of time can be calculated considering time in in these intervals so and each and every interval corresponds to a single event of interest, a single death in our case. Now, the probability of survival month two is the probability of surviving month one multiplied by the probability of surviving month two, but provided that the patient has survived month, month one. So this is a conditional probability. And so the final probability would be a geometric um, sequence of these interval probabilities. So now, um, the Kaplan-Meier curve is represented in this way. It's, it's a fraction, it's, it's a survival probability, which is a fraction, basically fraction of patients um, over time. So this, this declining curve tells you that over time, um, less and less patients um, are still alive, right? And this is a step function uh, because um, basically you can't, you can't do a sloping because, um, uh, because it's a fraction. And so it is a step function here. And so the survival probability, this S, is a geometric sequence of those fractions of still alive patients at each and every time interval. So um, these are the step functions. Um, they look like this, and these vertical tick marks are censored observations. And immediately um, uh, looking at these two curves, you can say that the uh, poor outcome group is a much smaller group because you can see you know, big shifts big steps like that and you can clearly see that there is much fewer patients in this group compared to this group now how you how you use these kaplan meier curves so the question is what is the probability of a patient uh, to survive 2.5 months given that a patient presents um, uh, symptoms characteristic to this group which was used to construct this Kaplan-Meier curve. And the probability is 0.5. Now, for instance, you are dealing with two subgroups of patients, treated patients and untreated patients. And you are uh, looking at their survival experience. Now, are these survival experiences significantly different? Can you tell 
this from Kaplan Meyer curve, how well they separate? No, you can't. You need a p value. And the low rank test give you this possibility to estimate the significance of survival experience differences. So it is a non parametric method to test the null hypothesis that compared groups are samples from the same population with regard to the survival experience. In other words, it tests the hypothesis um, um, uh, with, with regard to the null hypothesis that there are no differences in survival experience. So, but at the same time, it tells you whether these survival experience are different, but it doesn't tell you how much different. So, the way log rank text uh, test works is that um, for each uh, time interval, uh, so the, the time scale is divided into the time intervals corresponding to uh, each and every event of interest. And we compare proportions uh, of still alive subjects at every time interval. And then we summarize this across all of the intervals. So it's, it's similar to the chi-square test, which is designed to compare proportions. Um, and so, and it's even expressed similarly to the chi-square test. So this is a chi-square test. Um, this is observed and expected proportion when you compare uh, two groups. And uh, the expression for the log rank text uh, test looks like this, uh, where you also have observed and expected uh, uh, proportions. Um, and then you compare uh, the these uh, the chi-square statistics to the chi-square distribution with the chi minus one degrees of freedom and you get your p-value now low rank test does not tell you how much different survival experiences are but hazard ratio does so the hazard ratio is a simple measure it um, measures relative survival in two groups based on the complete period studied so you have, um, by, by the end of the study, you have two groups with observed and expected uh, proportions of people who are still alive. And then you just take a ratio, and this will be your hazard ratio. So hazard ratio of 0.43, for example, would be a relative risk or hazard of poor outcome, I'm sorry, under the conditions of group one, is 43% of that of group two. So group one is doing better. The risk, the hazard for group one is only 43% of group two. So group one is doing, is doing better. So now uh, the, the downside of hazard ratio is that it gives you a relative risk for the entire period of a study but then uh, it may not be necessarily that it's consistent throughout all of the uh, time points along the study. And so it makes sense uh, to check for the, to compute the, uh, the hazard ratio for a number of time points and then see how consistent it is across time intervals. Now, none of these methods can basically um, uh, comprehensively take into account the effect of multiple variables on the survival experience. For that purpose, we have a Cox proportional hazard model, which is a uh, statistically quite complicated model itself. I, I will not give you uh, a lot of details of that, but I will explain to you what it is and we will be practicing um, its application on the real clinical data. So uh, it can be, so the goal of, of this model is to investigate the effect of several covariates on survival experience. And if, if that's the case, if you have multiple variables, that would be multivariate proportional hazard regression model. However, you can have a univariate when you just uh, um, simplify your analysis by using just only one uh, covariate. Now, what is this? Um, um, so uh, method, um, the hazard function uh, behind the Cox regression model um, is estimated in the following matter. So this is a hazard function right there. 
and uh, x1 to xp are independent variables of interest, such as uh, tumor size, stage, hormonal status, um, perhaps amplification status of a certain region in the genome or expression level of a certain gene of your interest. And then Bs, or betas, 1 through P, are regression coefficients that are supposed to be estimated by the model. And then uh, the model has the assumption that the effect of variables is constant over time and additive in a particular scale. So similarly to Kaplan-Meier curve, this hazard function, and this is a baseline, this, uh, the H0T is a baseline hazard. So, so um, it, it is similar to Kaplan-Meier uh, survival uh, probability. So the hazard function is a risk of dying after a given time, assuming survival thus far. It is a cumulative function. And as I mentioned, H0T is a cumulative baseline or underlying function. And then probability of surviving, similar to the Kaplan-Meier survival, uh, survival estimator, can be expressed through this hazard function, like uh, in the following formula. Uh, and so for every individual with the given values of covariates, of our multiple variables in the model, we can estimate this probability of survival for a given length of time. Those independent variables interest the x1 to xp. Something I've always been confused about is what is that a is that a uh, it's a proportion? Is it a probability? What's no, the these are actual values okay. of clinical variables. Say uh, it can be binary. Okay. Say nodal status, zero or one. Okay. It can be staging, one, two, three, four. It can be categorical. It can be a continuous. So say a certain level of a certain, you know, expression level of some sort, right? So it is pretty much continuous. So it can be different type of um, of data. Okay, but it's a quantitative well, semi-quantitative, I guess, if it's binaries or one zero, but it's a numerical. If, if it's numerical, then it's continuous and it's qualitative, right? Okay. Yes, yeah. the coefficient is kind of the weight of that variable. And the coefficients are exactly the things that we want to get out of the model. They are estimated by the model, mm -hmm. and um, they are used for interpretation of a uh, contribution of a corresponding variable mm -hmm. into the risk a poor outcome for a patient. And now the expression uh, within these brackets is often called a prognostic index, uh, which is probably uh, uh, some of you have heard of. So how do we interpret the results uh, of a Cox regression model fitting process? So this is, this is a um, uh, result um, an example, I'm sorry, um, where um, you see a number of clinical variables that were used for multivariate uh, regression model. And uh, columns two, three, and four are uh, contain the output of the regression model. The first column is the coefficient itself, coefficient B. The second column is the standard error of this coefficient. And the last column is the exponential of, of the uh, regression coefficient. So now, immediately, two observations, two uh, main things. The sign of a coefficient and a magnitude. That's what we should be looking at. So the sign means positive or negative association with poor survival. So wh whenever you see the negative sign, it has negative association with poor outcome, which is the good the prognostic factor. Yes. So wh whenever you see the positive sign, um, it has a positive association with poor outcome. So this refers to the association with poor outcome. <coughs> 
coefficient. So if your regression coefficient is going to be zero, your x, x your x b is going to be one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what is this exponential of b? Um, so uh, this is used to assess the magnitude of a contribution of any given variable. And how it is done is as follows. The magnitude refers to the increase in log hazard for an increase of one in the value of the covariate. And it's evident, uh, uh, I'm sorry, obvious from this formula down there. So in other words, if you increase, say, um, if you increase the age by one year, you will get an instant increase in risk by, um, this is a fold increase. So this would be 100%, which, uh, which um, uh, I'm sorry, and, and this is a relative, this is relative to, um, to the baseline. Which, which is before increasing by one. So it's it's a bit confusing. Let me let me illustrate this using this uh, these numbers. So see, this is an increase of value of the variable by one of this variable by one will result in this increase relative to baseline. So if if it's hundred percent, then it's just basically no change. It's hun it's it's. It's 100% um, of what it used to be before the increase by 1. Now, 95% means that if you increase by 1, you get a reduction by 5%. So you'll get 95% of what it used to be before you added 1. Is so it clear? Your, your, whatever your baseline risk group is, depending on the results of those variables, you multiply it by the other. So it's relative. So it's relative. Yeah, so if you increase the serum bilirubin in whatever scale it was, in whatever scale it was, by one, you'll get this increase. Relative, so it's going to be 1,231% off the, the control. yeah which is the level of serum bilirubin less by one so that's how you can interpret this and now um, as I mentioned uh, uh, the hazard uh, can be used for um, for um, expressing the survival uh, probability and very similarly to Kaplan Meyer the estimation of a survival probability can be plotted similarly to Kaplan-Meier curves. And this is just an example for patients with uh, the drug and placebo uh, that were analyzed using Cox uh, re regression model. So can you estimate average survival gains by, by treatment, by, and by modeling the shift to the right of the, of the curve? Because it, it looks here like you're getting an average gain in survival of approximately a year. Just you know, taking, for example, the, any particular point in the azathioprine curve and going back to the placebo curve, it looks like that distance is approximately yeah. 12 months. So now, whether it is statistically significant, low-grain text would tell you. Now, whether it is clinically significant, it's a question. Now, so the, as with any statistical test, um, you always uh, consider both the significance and the magnitude of your change, right? And so even if it may be statistically significant with a p-value 10 to the minus 10, you, you get a, a difference, a really tiny difference, which is not clinically important. The same here. But sure, but if I look at that curve, it looks like actually after about 48 months, the curves are almost identical. It's just that they've already been shifted. Do you do you see what I mean? Like you could almost, if you shifted the azathioprine curve down, it would it would almost be exactly parallel to the. It would almost exactly match the placebo curve. Mm -hmm. 
So now, so the log rank test will tell you, is that measuring then the area under the curves, similar to, no. Or, or? No, no, no. And that's what I said with, re with regard to log rank test, tells you whether they are different statistically, significantly. Now, the hazard ratio tells you how much they're different, but based on the overall uh, study length. And as I mentioned, it makes sense to see wh uh, what are the hazard ratios at any given time intervals and then see, you know, how the hazard ratio is consistent over time points. But is there a test that you could do that would answer like I, I'm not, I'm not sure that I asked exactly that question. What I, what I was asking is, can you? I mean, eyeballing these curves, it looks like you could do a different statistical test, saying what is the average time difference mm -hmm. between the two curves. You, there's a probability of surviving, but it also looks as though the average person on the azathioprine curve mm -hmm. is living about a year longer than the average person mm -hmm. on the placebo curve. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. this is this is used sometimes, but uh, it is it is thought not to be a completely appropriate thing to do, to to use the same median or mean survival of a group, and then to bluntly compare it. It's it's not particularly. There are there are other methods which I'm not covering in this course, but uh, there are a certain summarization methods to basically summarize the differences in uh, survival experience. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 And and uh, our functions that we will be practicing later, uh, producing those um, pointwise uh, confidence intervals for kaplan meier curves. So the it should be noted that the power of the analysis depends on the number of terminal events, and that that are usually deaths. Right, and so the higher power requires longer follow-up times because death may not be that um, uh, may not be happening that often, not a often um, outcome. So the alternative to overcome this problem uh, of long follow-up times is to use the alternative uh, more frequent endpoint. And that would be time to the recurrence, and we'll we'll be using uh, that as an endpoint in our practice. And then um, estimation of a sample size to achieve required power is a really hard task, as I mentioned to you. And there are uh, nomograms that can help you to estimate um, the approximate uh, sample sa uh, sample size to achieve a desirable uh, power. So. Um, I'm wrapping up the introduction part uh, and we will be moving on to the practical work. So what have we learned from this part? That clinical data is highly important component and is intrinsically different from genomic transcriptomic data. Survival data is a special type of data requiring special methodology and main applications of survival analysis uh, were summarized in that slide that I showed you in the very beginning and they involve three um, fundamental statistical tests. kaplan meier survival estimation, uh, log rank test for uh, differences in survival experiences, and contribution of multiple risk factors to the overall survival. And that is done, uh, used Cox regression model. So these are the useful references for you uh, in case you want to look uh, further into the topics and um, we can take a very short break if you like, really a few minutes and then uh, we will start the lab. <laughs>